Hey everyone, welcome to the next segment of our Tech in the Future of News conference slash panel. We have a really, really, really excellent panel ahead of you. I'm really, this is my favorite one of the day so far. Um, so uh, really quick introductions and I'll let you all sort of give a little bit about your background, but we have Millie Tran of the Texas Tribune. Are you based in Texas right now, Millie? I'm in New York. Um, okay. I was mid move um, during the pandemic. Yeah, that's par for the course. So just had to check there. Um, Eric Torenberg of Village Global on deck, a variety of tech companies. Eric, are you in San Francisco right now? I'm actually spending some time in uh, Prescott, Arizona, but uh, but normally I'm based in, in San Francisco. Close enough. And Jared, um, I think you're in New Jersey right now. Yes. Yeah, so um, Jared is at the Washington Post and has been involved in numerous digital media companies and in the broader blockchain space. So the broad theme of this conference is sort of the future of the news industry, especially as relates to the intersection of tech. So I th what I think I'd really love to sort of start this off is sort of go to each of you and sort of get the sort of perspective that each of you sort of hold about the future of the industry um, from the perspective of your vantage point. So Jared, I'll start with you. You're at the Washington Post. You have a lot of thoughts about sort of the way that media companies need to evolve as sort of creators and sort of individual writers become more of a centerpiece of value. So let's just sort of start there. How do you think about this space from sort of an optimism, pessimism, middling <laughs> perspective? Yeah, I'll be optimistic because I'm going first. Um, so uh, I'd say that I think we're we're in an awesome kind of like inflection point for what's happening in the media industry, whether that's for larger brands or what we're seeing across the independent creator space. Um, what I'd say is like most exciting for us to start thinking about is that um, with kind of the emergence of new platforms and people being able to go independent and essentially build build media companies around themselves. Uh, we're really starting to rethink what the relationship between media brands and creators are starting to look like. Uh, I think that there's a big focus on like tools that are out there. And, you know, that's kind of been traditionally uh, the thinking of like, you know, there's things like Substack or there's different CMSs or um, kind of products like Medium. But I think what's really most interesting now from a future media perspective is kind of the economics behind these relationships, like what is the brand creator or, or the media brand creator relationship? What do economics look like when these independent creators aren't just licensing content, but essentially licensing themselves <laughs> and their own brand? Um, so I think like for me, what's, what's kind of um, most exciting, if you're a large media company, really starting to think about, well, how do you start to also become a talent company? How do you start to build business around that talent, um, which is um, not, not insanely comfortable, I'd say, for a lot of a lot of these kind of century plus old institutions. And then for these more um, kind of like independent new uh, creators or media brands, um, what does kind of the future economics for a media company look like when you're not maybe investing in an engineering team or building a CMS or having to have a sales team or having to do distribution? I think we're we're really starting to kind of redefine what a modern day media company looks like, regardless of you know, your seniority in the space or the amount of people that work there. Awesome. And Eric, obviously you're in venture capital, you're working with Ondex, so you're deeply interested in sort of what podcasters and newsletter writers, and you're also interested in sort of the tools that people sort of use. How do you look at this space sort of moving forward? Yeah, I have two, I look at this from, from two angles. Uh, so Village Global is a, is a early stage venture firm and Ondex is a is an education company, sort of like a digital trade school. And one of our goals at Ondex um, and, and Village is to help make more entrepreneurs, uh, help make it easier, remove friction uh, for more people to start uh, businesses. Now, some of that is is technical, but some of that is also cultural. Um, so one of the angles I look at this is uh, the relationship between uh, tech and media and how that is sort of uh, evolved or, or devolved uh, over time. And so um, you know, and there's also this narrative about tech building its own um, its own sort of media ecosystem. And so we have programs for writers, we have programs for podcasters, and that, that's something that we're, we're trying to do and we get in late, later in this conversation. But that's the one angle I look at it. The other angle I look at it is how to encourage, uh, how to enable more creators to uh, make a living off of what they do. And subscription is one way, but there are other additional business models um, that I'm excited about for, for creators. So those are sort of the two angles that I think about, uh, or that I want to discuss in this conversation. 
And Millie, your leading product at Texas Tribune, I was particularly interested in your perspective, given that you're at the local regional level and is the sort of is going to come out through this conversation. One of the biggest things that newsletter writers, individual creators could do is they could serve really niche sort of audiences. And I think Texas, Austin, et cetera, those are the definitions of what these sort of audiences sort of look like. So I'm just sort of curious how you as someone who's focused on building products in this local regional space, how do you think about sort of the industry? Because I think the conversations tends to be a little Washington Post, New York Times centric, no offense, uh, Jared, of course, but yeah, I'd love your perspective. Um, so I, I well, let me start by introducing myself really quickly, because I think the title kind of um, can be a little misleading because I, at the Tech Tribune, in my role, I oversee our audience team as well as our engineering and design and data and marketing and comms and loyalty teams, which is our membership team. Um, and I like to share that because I think we think of product as kind of traditionally just um, the tech side of the house, but really, product at a news organization, you can't like um, pull it back from the news and the the core product at a news organization is the news, right? Um, so just a little bit on my background, like I've worked in news and media kind of my entire career across a variety of roles and organizations. And, you know, one of the reasons I came to the Tribune is that one, it's an innovative leader in what I believe is um, kind of one of the greatest crises facing our democracy to like take it down from Jared's optimism. Um, I think the collapse of local news is a really, um, important issue. And when you don't have strong local news, partisan news outlets, and worse, like outright fake news fill that vacuum. And, you know, as I was thinking about this panel, I was reminded of this um, story from it, just a few days ago about um, the Stockton mayor, Michael Tubbs, who is like a democratic rising star in the city's first black mayor, as well as like its youngest. And He's at risk of losing his reelection this year because a local blog whose founder like has openly acknowledged that he has a grudge against Tubbs and has also said like the goal of the publication is isn't to be fair or accurate or balanced and that they are not in fact journalism, though they are classified as news on Facebook. Um, so, you know, while that city Stockton's local newspaper, The Record, has struggled with staff cuts like we've kind of seen all over the country. We have this blog that has over like 100,000 followers on Facebook, on Instagram, and gets like millions of interactions every month. So I think I, I'm thinking a lot about kind of the local, the, the media ecosystem overall and kind of at the systems level, like you have this vacuum that, you know, power and information abhors a vacuum. So like things will fill it. Um, and I think I, I'm, I have the perspective of like the more accurate and fact-based news, the more reporting you can have in this ecosystem, the better. Um, and that's that's going to be a combination of like the Washington Post and the New York Times, but also like individual reporters who are kind of finding their own ways to um, do journalism. So I think like there's no going backwards. Um, and I think we'll continue to have kind of this vibrant and potentially kind of scary um, ecosystem, but I think the more we can infuse that ecosystem with um, fact-based journalism, the better. Yeah, so here's a good place to start, um, given what you just said, Millie. What is journalism, right? So in, in, the, in the sense that, right, because you're to your point, there's a, there's a local blog that's powered by Facebook and has its sort of own quote unquote editorial standards that they're sort of abiding by. And it's obviously one that I think I'm not sure about you, Eric, as much, but definitely like Millie and Jared, your organizations like would not sort of abide by in different sort of levels. So to your point about no going back though, it's not as if the Texas Tribune or sort of like the, the let's say whatever the San Jose, like the, that paper, they, they can't just wish. Mercury it news. <laughs> yeah. The Mercury, Mercury news can't just sort of say, listen, everyone fake news. It's not sort of real. So what is journalism today when basically anyone can say they are a journalist and can fulfill journalistic functions? Um, I'm going to do an annoying thing and um, pick on Jared a little bit because Jared, like I saw that um, you had a tweet the day after election about like, it's obvious in kind of times like these that like, this is why media institutions matter. And like, there's a reason that institutions are what they are because of their purpose and reputation 
Um, so I, I, I think that we have to acknowledge like the power of legacy news and institutions. And I don't think like any individual like Substack will fill that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so so I'm happy that you were picking on me for a good reason. I was nervous for a second. Um, so so yeah. I mean, like I think I think um, like going on what Millie's saying. Like think about what happened last week. You know, at a at a time, especially in the United States in our country, where um, everyone was like grasping on to any bit of information that was coming out um, and felt like it was so critical to like their mood, right? Um, you know, any conversation, they were basically like crippled by it. And if you think about the places that you were looking to get that information and what was mattering most to you, it suddenly became a very small media world. Like in a place like when your Twitter feed is constantly flowing and there's blogs and, you know, there's a lot of analysis um, and conversations happening. All of a sudden over the past last week, there was like, five people I really cared about hearing from. And there were like only a specific amount of URLs that I would click on. And I had, you know, CNN and even like, you know, Fox and MSNBC on via broadcast. And you really start to realize at that point when um, there's critical information and times like that, you know, you really, really, really rely on institutions that have proven themselves over and over again to be able to be accountable and dependable and uh, reliable. Like I always say, especially when we think about journalism, like like trust is really earned. It's not learned. And I think we've even seen that with a lot of like challenger media companies, even like a decade ago that were going to change the game, like BuzzFeed, who's actually done an amazing job with news and Vox and all of these companies. And 10 years later, right, they're they're like not at the stature that they were. And, you know, they 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 are not those media organizations that you turn to during these most important times and you end up going back to these institutions that have that have earned your attention and kind of have been critical when it comes to kind of that sort of information delivery. I mean, the one thing that I'd say with journalism is that um, and it's difficult, right, especially in conversations now when everyone is talking about people going independent and kind of the unbundling of, of media organizations is that news is really especially like journalism and news is really kind of a separate category. And I think that that's important. Like, I think like the brand in journalism is way more critical than say, you know, the brand in maybe a CPG category or in a tech uh, media media company. Like, I think brand carries a lot with it. I think the people that are working within it are working there because of that brand. There is a lot of reputation tied behind that. Um, and I think that it's true. Like, I think like, uh, I think that um, it's, the, I'm with Millie there. Like, like I subscribe to many Substacks. I'm a fan of the analysis. Um, again, granted, last week when there was so much information, that was the last shit I really wanted to read. I really like didn't even like care to even check in on that stuff. Like, I was so glued to getting news and kind of what was happening. Um, um, kind of like what was happening politically there. But I do think that it's going to be insanely hard to disrupt like actual journalism, especially when it comes to the news side, because I do think like even though I am optimistic and excited about business models and new methods that could be built around individual people you know when it comes to the end of the day what consumers care about it is the brand like i taught i taught a journalism class a few weeks ago and you know um they like a very very prominent media company not the washington post but one of the other two um uh did did a survey with their most loyal subscribers like their longest most loyal subscribers to name um, you know, like how many writers they go there for, how many writers they can name, and they average two, right? It was all about the brand. So like as much as we want to believe and move towards this independent space when it comes to things like journalism or, um, you know, kind of information that you're insanely reliable on, usually you look way past that individual and it is, it is a relationship with that brand. May I just add two things there, which is like, I think there for sure is an interplay between like brand of a person or whoever and an institution and like one they like feed off of each other right i think you know if you ask someone who they follow for x topic i think they're more likely to say a person than an institution but they also benefit from kind of all the infrastructure of that institution um and jared i want to go back to what you were saying about kind of attention and when you like really acutely need focus and that curation. And that's why you like relied on 
three people last week. It's, they're like two of them are probably named Nate. You know, like I think like there, there's a time where curation and that like trust is so important. And Eric, I, I actually sorry to pick on you now, but I know you've written a lot about curation and like the value of that. And I think that's important to um, talk about too. Yeah. yeah. So Eric, real quick, um, just to get my framework in here, I, I sort of see your job, your day job being challenging legacy institutions, right? You're sort of thinking what like the job of venture capitalist or sort of what OnDeck's trying to do. So yeah, we need your perspective here. Yeah. Well, and, and particularly on the university level, but 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 also also in media. I, I'm curious, Millie, um, <clears throat> besides sort of the uh, like I have no romance to traditional institutions or or you know new institutions or whether it's individuals. I just want the best quality product, and you can determine. You know, you could ask it, it, what what picks the best quality product. Is it the wisdom of the crowds? Is it a select group of individuals? But can you can you sort of try to convince me for someone who has no romance for traditional institutions, just want wants the best product, and whether it's you know new you know uh, Barry Weiss and Greg Greenwald and go and you know unbut you know create Substacks and then create their own sort of like new media institution that rivals the old ones. Why, why should I care more for legacy media institutions as opposed to just whoever can make the best best product? Um, I am very impressed that I have become the institutionalist in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> the, the legacy institutionalist. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I, I most recently worked at the New York Times and um, love it as an institution. And I think I can kind of answer from that perspective, which is, the institution allows for the best journalism, right? Um, I don't think you can get a story like um, Trump taxes that, you know, that team worked on for months on end anywhere else. Like how, how do you finance that with a sub stack, right? How do you finance that with like, it, it, like an independent organization? And I think that that's kind of what I think Jared was talking about in that, like we can have kind of a, vibrant and dynamic ecosystem, but you like, it's very hard to replace and supplant that type of journalism. And that's why you should support institutions. Well, so I, I, but how about the idea of legacy institutions versus new institutions in technology, for example, we don't sort of like, you know, uh, miss IBM, we just create Microsoft or we don't miss Microsoft, we, we create Apple or, you know, or, or like we just, you know, you take the best 20 New York Times journalists and they'll create a new competitor. Do you lament sort of that? And, and maybe it starts them going one at a time. In that world where that happens, are you, is there something lost there? Or do you think, no, that, that's as long as it's an institution that has real heft to it and can do do the work, um, I'm, I'm okay whether it's new or old. Do you have a perspective on that? I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting for you to place Apple as like a startup in this like current. Well, they, they were a startup at one point. I, I'm just like I, the evolution of technology company. I think that that's, that's the power of a successful startup that like becomes an institution and working at a company now that is a little over 10 years old, I would say like, that's what we should strive for. Right. Which is that, that like institutional trust and brand. And like, that's what makes the journalism. And like, I believe if you can create that institution and infrastructure to support more people, that's one way to do it. Right. But I, I'm not sure that it comes at the expense of, startups right um so i guess i can i'm gonna say like you can have both yeah so totally. i want to jared i want to bring in you you real quick on this because eric what i'm sort of hearing is missing from your analysis is the importance of brand which is what jared is talking about in the sense that so sure like Gren greenwald um and barry weiss and sort of people are sort of alt center idw adjacent could always form their publication um, but that publication isn't going to get press credentials in the White House. It's not going to have a foreign correspondent. And those sort of like those those legacy benefits that sort of come are things you get by having a hundred year plus history. Those are sort of like, and if if we're sort of looking where did the do, do, digital challengers underestimate things, they underestimated the importance of those dynamics. But Jared, that's sort of your thought that I'm parroting. Yeah, so well, like let's get you I in. mean, I mean, I think like I think that it could be argued on either side. I mean, I do I do think that um, especially in the local, you know news space ones that aren't um as sound in their business right texas tribune definitely is but like there's many that you know aren't and you know yes they're critical but you know financially they're having a lot of difficulty you know supplementing kind of the fixed costs that have built their business and also kind of like maintaining their legacy costs but one thing that i'd say about brand like 
in this conversation that I think is important that definitely doesn't get discussed enough. And I think a lot of that is the fault of, you know, our our legacy institutions is that there are um, like like we are set up ethically at these traditional media organizations, like um, to the point where, again, right, news, news and opinion are separated, like literally how they were printed on a newspaper, how they're labeled digitally, how they sit right on floors like in D.C., the news like Marty Barron and his team sit on the fifth floor and, you know, whatever, like the opinions, uh, Fred Hyde and the opinion writers sit somewhere else. Like they literally don't cross. And, you know, when, when you talk about like the importance of institutions, especially when it comes to like factual information, that's literally the ethos and the ethics of like how a news organization is built and what they must abide by. And, You see it in broadcast right now, right? Like CNN and Fox and MSNBC, they're not traditional news organizations, right? So they blur those lines constantly, right? Like there's definitely like subjectivity, there's angles, right? There's like more of the blurring the lines. And traditionally, right, like a Washington Post or a New York Times or a Wall Street Journal, um, in the opinion section, you may have, right, like a lot of that subjectivity, but in the news, you're not supposed to, right? And it's up for argument whether or not some things are like bending, but like that's something that I think is like very important, especially when you think about the attractiveness to to Substack and, you know, the writers that we're mentioning. We're mentioning writers, you know, that within a news organization would be on the opinion side and, you know, would be kind of sharing their analysis and their thoughts around certain things. Um, they wouldn't be, right, the newsroom editors. They wouldn't um, kind of be, be, be reporting in that way. And um, and it's not even like just critical based on like how consumers trust it, but think about who provides, right? Like the lifeblood of the news cycle to the big broadcast channels. It's the New York Times, it's the Wall Street Journal over the political, um, over kind of the, the um, over the election period, it's local news, right? So like CNN isn't breaking news, even though they say it constantly, right? Like they're getting information from Maggie Haberman, they're getting information um, you know, from from folks at the Post or folks at the Journal, because that is where news comes from, because that is how they're operationally set up to do so. So there's like another combo that we could go deep into, which I think is really interesting, which is like, like breaking news really is kind of like the most critical component of how the content life cycle works, right? News breaks, then there's analysis, then there's kind of aggregation and conversation, and then it goes out yonder, right? Or something else comes up. And that usually starts within these institutions. So like, I think like it is different. I don't think like a Washington Post um, is like better or worse than, you know, like the defector or, you know, these new kind of sites that are kind of creating on their own. But I do think that it is important to acknowledge those couple of things. One is the ethics within these news organizations are very important. They are critical they are supposed to be abided by and we should do a better job conveying that to consumers because i think they'd benefit from really understanding that the second is knowing that a lot of that information is coming from these sources how that's then being shared and aggregated and analyzed changes right like everyone everyone subscribes to ben thompson i'm sure on this in this group um and ben thompson puts analysis on breaking news right so like someone needs to get that information someone has to have the sources someone needs to put that stuff out there in order for us to benefit from you know kind of what's happening outside may i just correct the record on one thing because i love to correct the record like cnn does break news i would say and i i would say jared what you're getting at is kind of um like the backbone of a lot of these startups eric to your question earlier are built off of like original reporting from a lot of like institutional or like legacy organizations right i'm thinking about um Axios and the, the announced um, that they're going to launch in several kind of medium and local markets, regional, where there's strong local news for them to curate their reporting for a different audience, right? So I think like there there are lots of things that um, those news organizations can do better to like connect with and interact with their audience. So you don't have an Axios come on top of them and say like, I'm gonna better curate this for your audience um, of your own journalism. So I, I think there's like a lot of missed opportunity there for those legacy organizations. And that's probably why you're seeing a lot of them like 
I'm not going to say fail, but like not be, that's why you, that's how you create space for something like Axios to come in to do that. Yeah. M Marshall, you, you, you characterized some of my work as disrupting legacy industries. If I wanted to be more flippant about it, and this is particularly in the university system, I would say, you know, my work is trying to disrupt a cartel. Um, and you create more efficient markets such that the best product can can can, can rise to the top. I, I think if you transpose that to the media ecosystem, I, I, the question I would ask is how many um, you know people who work at the New York Times, if if just as an example, if they had the opportunity to match their salary, um, would would go independent or would try to create a new institution that that competed with it? And uh, I would propose that that would be. Uh, that that's an exciting world uh, where where people have have the opportunity to do it if, if they don't think that the New York Times is the institution for them that they have a chance to to compete and consumers are the one who uh, who get to choose you know who, who's best and, and and win from that. I, it's this, the startup called Stir recently launched a product. Um, I forget what it's called, but the basic idea is that you can. Um, it's almost like Kickstarter for journalists to leave their leave their job. Right, that's it. Yeah, yes, exactly. You you can pre-subscribe to uh, you know. If, let's say Barry Weiss before she left the New York Times, and she could see basically how much she's she could make on the on the open market, um, and you could imagine a, a bundle of, of writers doing doing that as well. Um, and and I imagine that there's some percentage. I don't know if it's ten percent. I don't know if it's lower. I don't know if it's much higher. That do feel a little trapped in the sense that they they don't feel that that institution represents them well, or they're, they, they that you know represents the work that they want to do. And if they had the opportunity to do it elsewhere, would, would seize that uh, or on their own. Would, would seize that opportunity. What, what, what's your how do you y'all react to that? Yeah, so quick thing. I just I we're gonna keep picking on each other because it's fun and it makes it different. I feel like you're kind of cheating though, Eric, because you're cheating by saying, imagine a world where hundreds of the thousands of people who work for the New York Times could get their salary. And you're just sort of, you know, a priori offering that up because that's just not the reality. The reality is, and this is the unfortunate reality that for a so perfect example, I don't see a world where the New York Times as China reporters could each individually replicate their salary in a world where they're sort of competing in that sort of space. Also where you have sort of Bill Bishop sort of operating on Substack. I don't see a world where, you know, there are parts of the, and to now throw this back, but I think that you're, you're undercounting the subsidization that happens within any sort of bundling process. So for example, no one's expecting a world where the New York Times as transportation writer is going to build a massive sort of Substack audience. And that's sort of what's being undercounted here, but I'll throw it to the rest of y'all. I think one other thing that's being unaccounted is like the value of editing, right? Like you can, you can make money anywhere. You can like write anything and get paid for it hopefully eventually. But like, I think the value is in the editing and again, the infrastructure. And that's why you see like steps that kind of slowly starting to provide infrastructure, even if it's not what I'm talking about, which is editing, right? It's like um, their legal assistance, right? Because when you write anything you want, you can also get sued. Um, so how do you, you write? <laughs> right. So I think all of those costs aren't accounted for when we just say, like, can you make your salary? Right. It's it's like because we live in the U.S. and our healthcare system is the way that it is. Like those are other considerations. So I I, I think it's very hard to fully account for all of those hidden costs, and that's why like being a part of an institution is beneficial in those ways, but. But you also see like, you know, um, the former debt spin crew start to factor and like found success with their audience in that way. So I, I do think there's space for both. But I think you're starting to see kind of um, things going in both directions more rapidly, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, like, I agree there. I mean, I think like it's a. Uh... It's a big opportunity for what's happening in the creator space, because I do think that when you start to identify a bit more of like why um, why writers right want to work at these institutions, there's a lot of variables, right? Like I think one of which is that they actually believe and want to build for the institution and love kind of the brand that it brings and, you know, the brand that it allows themselves to build. But there is that like what I call like creator confidence and creator comfort right creator creator confidence is like i have an editor i have a designer i have researchers i have fact checkers like my work is better right it's like it's like if you're like cutting an album as a musician and you don't get a producer right you could choose not to but if it's produced it's oftentimes better it sounds better it gets better distribution like there's a lot of benefits behind that 
And then the and then on the other side, which is comfort, is like, yeah, like health insurance, libel, all of these things that that are so critical for people to have the mindset to do their job so that they're not distracted. Um, I do think though, like like, and I'm and I'm very high on this idea, and I think we're seeing it right now with um, some some on Substack, but some that are independent. Is that I think like you are seeing. Um, a big concentration of success of independent creators who aren't traditionally from like the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post or Vox and going out on their own. I think like you have this like wave of new creators, people who are entrepreneurial, might have ran a business like like I love the everything bundle example, like with Nathan, who like they have a unique point of view. They're writing about something that's interesting, um, but right they're they're also like prepared to enter this world, which is no longer just about creating content or focusing on a vertical. It's about building your own business, doing audience development, figuring out how to drive uh, how to drive revenue out of the work that you're doing. Right? It's very it's very entrepreneurial. It's very business background, um, you know, and not as much kind of like just focusing on content. So I think like, it's very easy for us to think about like. Like we see people like Casey, right, who's fantastic, who left Vox and built his own. And I think like that's actually like 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 the exception to the rule, I'd say. Like there are definitely like particular people who could do that, but many can't. But you'll see a lot of people who who like have a unique point of view, who are entrepreneurial, might have been previous founders who understand that hustle and are like, I'm going to create a brand around myself. I'm going to create content. I have a unique point of view around this. And people people are kind of jumping on that, right? Like you kind of have this, this kind of moment in the um, independent creator world, like in the Substack world, where like you're actually paying for education or analysis or things that are like helping you do your job better or helping you feel more informed, more so than like thinking about how I could get better news, right? Or things like that I'm getting from a larger brand. So like I'm like excited about that world. And I think we're seeing some acceleration there. Um, yeah. So, yeah, sorry, Eric, go, please. Yeah, the thing I'd add to, to your take, Marshall, is, um, it, it, yes, I'm making a big assumption, which is that the amount of people who are independent right, right now or, or could go independent, that if we were to you know take that uh, number you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, it'd be a you know, tiny, tiny fraction. Um, and, and so I, I said it to say that you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, um, th this number two will, will be a fraction of, of what it will be because people will continue to build their brands, you know, direct direct to the audience, um, and and continue to, to there'll be tools like pre-subscribe that can really make a more efficient market over who who's who's creating more value than they're capturing, um, and and who's being subsidized. And the people that are being subsidized will stay, and the people that are creating more will, will likely, you know, many of them will leave. And um, that that that's an assumption that I'm making. Yeah, what yeah, I'll add is, I mean, like, I think, I mean, like, to that point, Eric, like, I think smart media companies should like identify those those like you know power players and think yep. about how they could like broker a tighter relationship right like you think about right like you think about um i think today and like i may be wrong here but like i think if you work at the new york times and if you get a book deal you could get sabbatical on the book deal but the new york times isn't publishing your book right they, they they're like not they're like not tied in on that business opportunity and they just like allow that to happen outside. They encourage it, but they're not a part of it. Like I do feel like media companies who are driving this talent and are investing in this talent could think about new ways to like better broker the business for the long term, whether that's sharing IP or figuring out how to like, I was like talking to someone about this today, right? Like instead of like New York Times thinking about their, their like opportunity to like extend on social or do something via YouTube, they like say, let's build the Taylor Lorenz brand and have it be a part of it and figure out how we extend that. And you really start to like multiply your assets. And like, again, I think it's like an exception. Like not all creators will want to do that. Not all will be willing to do that. But I do think that it is smart for media companies to think about how they could cultivate an interesting environment for people that are thinking that way, where the option, the only option isn't just to leave. Yeah. Yeah, Eric, I think I appreciate your healthy dose of sort of optimism here because I'm imagining this panel 10 years ago and I would have probably been saying, well, no one's going to pay for news and no one's going to pay for anything at all. Right. So when you, yeah. when you, when, when the New York times puts up a successful paywall, that creates new opportunities. And to your point, you know, to argue against myself, when you do create new opportunities, that could shift sort of user behavior. But Millie, something I'm curious 
about is how do you think this conversation applies to the local slash regional space, right? Because when we're, because I think the, the trends here matter, right? So the trends are, it's cheaper than ever to create content. There are all of these sort of lean options for things. People are sort of pivoting away from social driven scale. Subscriptions work more, diversification of revenue, et cetera. How does this apply to your sort of side of the world? Um, I think a lot of the big themes are still the same, right? Like we're still operating in the same media and information environment. Um, I would say what's different is like the coronavirus was a great example of this because it was such a like local, and I mean like literally your neighbor um, kind of local story where being on the ground made a huge difference in the like accuracy and reporting of the thing. Um, so I, I think one way I think about it is having, um, I, I actually think to go back, the, the trends are actually heightened, right? It's like even more important that you have a trustworthy person or source of news. Um, and I think that's why where I started with the Stockton story makes it a little bit scary because when you don't have that, you kind of see what's replaced in its um, in its absence. So I, I think we're dealing with a lot of the same like forces. Um, and I think that's kind of one of the mistakes, right? Which is that we think local is so different or, and like, because of that, we also treat local news in kind of a parochial way. Like, I, I don't think local news just has to be like school board um, meetings, right? It, it is about helping people live their lives. And the reason I mentioned coronavirus, because it, it was so much, it, it brought out and emphasized the importance of like reader driven and service driven journalism, which is something I think we overlook when we think a lot about like kind of the like big investigations or like, I, I don't know, like the Trump tax investigation, right? Like. I think a lot of the reporting that came out of the like last few months were really about how to like help people live their lives. And I think you kind of saw those lessons and instincts applied to the election, right? We had a lot of confusion around like how to vote, who can, like, when can you vote? Who can like do mail by, vote by mail? And a lot of that kind of like reader centric service driven journalism, um, like what was kind of um, faster. Um, so I, I, I don't think a lot of the lessons are too different. Yeah. So I have a, a listener question um, that and I'm trying not to parody this question um, and ask it in good faith. It seems like this conversation is pretty elite driven from a geographic location, right? So I'm in DC, Millie, you're in New York. I'm spiritually um, access though. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, so yeah, and then you know, Eric, you're by way of San Francisco, despite the vacation. Jared, I'm guessing you're within traveling distance of New York, and DC is always sort of close by. So, how much of these conversations, especially if we're looking at the local re regional picture, are hampered by this reality? Like, does it matter in this context? Yes, right. And I, this kind of goes back to what we were talking about in terms of like infrastructure and like. I, I'm using, I'm, I want to decouple infrastructure from institutions, right? Like the reason why like Substack and like it's like are so successful is because they make the barrier to entry to do a thing so much lower. And I think when you're thinking about local news organizations and, you know, organizations across the country in the places we are not at in, um, like, it's expensive to have an engineering team. It's expensive to have like a product team. It's expensive to have designers. It's expensive to have an app. Um, so I think all the ways in which we consume news, like the, the cost in making and producing and distributing and like learning from it in terms of the data we get and all of that, all those things are really high costs. Um, so I, I think what I'm thinking a lot about is kind of the move um, to that nonprofit model, to thinking about local news as more of a public good than like a transactional like subscription, right? I and again, I think there's places for both, but I don't think like 
the the New York Times, the Wall, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and other kind of subscription driven media are kind of singular in their success, I think. But you won't see that kind of in every city or every town that needs news. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I'd add that like when we look at so so we have two businesses at the post, we have, or two other businesses, uh, software businesses. So we have Arc Publishing, which powers a lot or powers now a thousand uh, media companies globally, um, and some of which are larger, kind of local institutions like Boston Globe and Dallas Morning News, and some get even smaller, like Willamette Week. And then the same with Zeus, which is our kind of revenue uh, side of that, that we license. And that powers now, I want to say, 130 local news sites um, nationally. And what's really interesting, like through the research, is um, there's so many different definitions of local now. And again, like Millie definitely knows this way better than me. So correct me <laughs> if, I, if I'm wrong here. But um, what I'm kind of seeing is like, you know, we've had, we've had these brands um, that have been kind of deemed local right? Like Dallas and Seattle times, and um, even like my hometown, like Asbury Park Press. Um, and they're still, and they're still local, right? And they're like, you know, trying to provide and create content at a local level. Um, but what consumers are now like looking for, like many readers are looking for, like from what they're getting from local are being provided by um, sites like Patch or Nextdoor or, you know, Facebook groups. Like I live in a small town in Jersey and we use Facebook groups for everything. Um, not for news, but like for, you know, selling things, for organizations, for meetups, like and all of those things, which, you know, used to be services provided by, by these local news companies. So like, I think what's interesting is like, we've had, we had a lot of local news brands and those brands, right, are still critical, but to some readers, they're often not local enough. Um, and for some of the services, they're not like providing those at a consumer level. So like the identity of what local is based on like if you're if you're the media company, if you're the reader, if you're the advertiser, I think is all changing. So it's just been like a very interesting, I think, evolution as to like what local is and depending on who you speak to versus like, I think traditionally how we've always thought of local news, which is like your, you know, the printed newspaper that you, you know, used to get every morning. Uh, so Eric, uh, please go. Yeah, I, I, a, a few points. So um, I'll sort of wrap them all in one. So one is um, going back to an earlier point about uh, media companies should try to keep these very ambitious, you know, power players. I think maybe record labels is an interesting sort of analog in the sense of you have sort of, you know, the, this, the, the, the parent company, and then you have all these sort of sub labels where they take all these ambitious artists who want to have, you know, uh, their own groups or artists underneath them and sort of give them a, a platform. And I wonder if they, they could have taken some of these journals and said, Hey, you're going to build your own, you know, sort of sub institution here and, and we'll fund you and support you and give you that infrastructure that you know, he's talking about that is so important. Um, I, I think that's an interesting analog, um, in terms of the local news, I wonder if just the form factor need, uh, needs to evolve a little bit in, 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 in the sense of there are a number of people on Twitter who I follow for, for local news that if they had a paywall over their Twitter, I would totally pay. Um, and, and just from tweets and just from, from videos, and that's not to say that there can't be like longer form analysis too, but I, I think that's interesting. And I'm seeing a couple of companies that are experimenting with, with that exact, exact product. And, and then the last point is going to the sort of elites versus, versus not elite point. Um, and going back to what we were originally talking about, fake news, I, I only see a future where more and more people are saying fake news, fake news, fake news. And my friend calls this a uh, kaleidoscope theory. Uh, so culture fragments into thousands of different shards. Each culture plays out its own fantasies alongside other cultures. The result is, is uh, skyrocketing cultural innovation at the cost of shared alignment on anything. Yeah, that's a... Thanks for the optimism, uh, Eric. <laughs> um, so I think uh, to finish up here, uh, Millie, I'm glad you brought up sort of the nonprofit model and sort of the nature of the way this sort of works. And this sort of goes, and so I'll direct this to Jared and Eric, because um, we've been focused more on sort of profit generating business model sort of ideas. Um, where's the opportunity here, right? Because if you're looking at the 2010 story, venture capital poured a lot of money into sort of those digital upstarts. And Jared, as I'm hearing your articulation, your, your articulation, Eric, there's a lot of opportunity in tools, right? So you're talking about stir, you're talking about sort of the sort of Twitter overlays you're talking about here, but is the opportunity on the sort of tool enablement level, or is there any opportunity at the sort of content 
and direct creator sort of label? Or is that something that has to be sort of bracketed in a sort of leaner, smaller sort of direction? Yeah, I mean, I could just take it from a macro. I mean, I think I think that, you know, over the past decade, there has been too large of an emphasis on the content itself, like, and not the producers of that content. And I think um, we've seen that through like a very strong ad model and, you know, VC investing in ad return businesses, right, where the whole goal was scale create content, output content around that scale and be able to kind of drive those returns. And I think where we're edging now is trying to broker tighter relationships where it's not just, you know, a relationship that I have with the content or even the brand, but that actual creator. Um, it's actually a very like interesting feeling. I don't know if anyone's ever broken up with someone on like broken up with the Substack subscription, but like it is very uncomfortable comparatively. Like it's very, yeah. it's like very easy for me to, you know, I would never cancel Netflix, but like cancel a Washington Post subscription or cancel, you know, a subscription from like a larger brand. But when you cancel a Substack subscription, like you have a relationship with the writer, they write you, um, you know, it's kind of more than just an exchange for content. You're kind of investing in this person to be successful. And when you break up with them, they're kind of like, whoa, like what did I do wrong? And what could I do better? So like, there really is this like new feeling around business models kind of in this next era where we're trying to like peel away um, kind of the element of like having it just live with, you know, that content and kind of tying it closer. And I think that's why you're seeing subscriptions, um, you know, be be like the topic du jour, because I think it's more about that investment, that relationship, trying to think about new business models that extend beyond it. So um, like I love what some sub stackers are doing um, and like what the information does, which is like, you're a member, you're not just getting content, right? You're, 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 you're being invited to private events. You're being invited to close conversations. You have status and identity within a community, right? You're kind of like cultivating this, this um, kind of new unique environment for, for people to be a part of. So like, that's where I think we're moving towards. And I strongly encourage people to move towards, like, I do think legacy, um, media is behind there. Like I do think when you look at the times and when you look at the post and when you look at the journal, um, that transactional element really has been the content and you subscribe to it and you get that content. And then like the, what else is still yet to be answered. I think we're seeing a lot of like more independent or smaller media companies really figure out what that, what else is, but that's where I see kind of things really moving relationship beyond content and really with creators or brands direct. Yeah. On, on the content side, VCs were really burned in the last uh, eight years or so uh, in, in investing in, in these uh, you know, new companies that have gotten pretty big, but j just aren't venture scale uh, in the same way that you know, these platforms are like you know, Facebook and Twitter and, and Snap, et cetera. And so I see, um, I see people continuing to, in, in, uh, to, to create new, new platforms. I see l less VCs wanting to in invest in them. I think more we're excited about um, tools that help uh, people, uh, creators monetize. Uh, we, we talked about a couple, um, quantify fandom, um, and, um, and then tools that sort of like make the, the content a bit better. And I'll describe that in a second on, on the quantify fandom, my request for, for startups here, and maybe I'll, I'll build it or fund it at some point is something that enables me as a reader of, let's say Millie's work to, uh, to find her to work and say, Hey, I was the fifth person to uh to read or to support her uh, i want to you know wear my badge uh and and that actually so i think that's very interesting it, it, people love being early uh to stuff if you can quantify your, your fandom and if you could sort of and I, I, not to get too into crypto stuff, but like sell that or that could have a monetary value depending on how early you got in um but if people could sort of make financial products based on uh their, their fandom i think that's very very interesting we'd love to see that and then on, on the content side, I'm more interested, you know, Bology has a bunch of ideas around incorporating prediction markets for so journalists are more sort of a, accountable and you can sort of assess, you know, who is, um, who's been correct in their, in their prediction or their assertions or who hasn't. And then also, uh, you know, sort of a, a, an annotation, like this was what Rap Genius was hoping that they would, or Genius was hoping they would be an annotation layer on top of the content such that anyone who's mentioned in any article can, can weigh in and say, you know, say, say their piece. So, so tools that either um, enrich the content, um, so, uh, you know, in sort of a, a mass way, um, and then tools that help quantify fandom such that people can monetize better is, is what I'm excited about as a venture capitalist. Uh, Millie, I'll give you the last word. What are you excited about? 
Um, I am excited about, I think that I'm excited about more fact-based journalism um, and whether that comes from institutions, from local news organizations, from Axios curating that local news uh, report, original reporting, or from individuals who like care deeply about a community or topic and are experts in their field, you know. Um, I, I can see like the Bill Bishop cynicism model applied to any number of communities or topics in a region or a city or a community. Um, and I think, again, lowering the barriers to entry to have more of that um, is exciting. That's great. Well, thank you guys, despite um, the um, critiquing uh, <laughs> everything. I think it's it's good that everyone's excited. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Great. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, guys.